by the time you're watching this video, Venezuela has probably invaded its neighbor Guyana. But if it hasn't already, it's most likely coming in the next few months. The Venezuelan government says 95% of voters have supported the country's claim over neighboring Guyana. The government hopes will strengthen its claim over a territory in uh, neighboring Guyana. Any Venezuelan will say the Esequibo belongs to Venezuela. We are working around the clock to ensure that our borders remain intact. Tensions are high. There are even fears of a military confrontation. In this video, I'll explain why invasion is highly likely and why everyone is getting it wrong. Media might have you believing it's because of oil, but I don't think the answer is that simple here. I think invasion will come as a last resort for the Venezuelan president in an attempt to hold power in a country that has struggled immensely under his rule. Craziest part of all this is the fact that this all started because of a secret deal between US, UK and Russia. So let's go over why Guyana is so important, why Venezuela wants to invade it, and what was the secret deal between the US, UK and Russia. Before that, let's start with the obvious. I'm a simple man. I make videos and in return, ask you guys to hit the like button below. So if you haven't already, please hit the like button under this video. It helps us out a lot. Also, consider subscribing. We are trying our best to hit 1 million subscribers by the end of this year. So let's start with Guyana. A lot of people may not know much about the country. Guyana is a small country in the northern part of South America, roughly the size of Idaho. Most of its area is covered by dense rainforest with very high biodiversity. Its population is also relatively small at only 800,000 people. But recently, it became very important on the world stage because it struck oil. And I don't mean that figuratively. What about people who say you're only interested in the Middle East for oil? What? Huh? Oil? Who says I'm like, oh, f you cooking? Oh. I just wanted to put that clip here because it's so funny. But getting back to the story. In 2015, Guyana found oil just off its coast. And then they looked even harder and found out that they have a boatload of oil. Keep this in mind as this will play a big part in the stuff we'll talk about later in the video. But a lot of people may think that Venezuela wants to invade Guyana for oil. But that's not entirely true. In fact, their dispute is actually more than a century old. And it all started with the British, because of course it does. In 1814, three Dutch colonies were transferred to the British, including the colony of Essequibo. But the big issue here was the fact that there was no western boundary to these territories. So British combined all the territories into one and named it British Guyana. Then they hired a German naturalist, Robert Schomburg, to survey the lands and draw borders. He arrived at a conclusion that later became known as Schomburg Line, which drew the border right here. Thus began the dispute. In 1840, Britain first published a map with new borders on it. Venezuela claimed that the Schomburg Line was not the actual border. True borders were closer to the Essequibo River. According to Venezuela, this whole Essequibo region was under their jurisdiction. Though, in 1850, both sides decided that they would not occupy the disputed area until the issue was resolved. However, soon after this, they found gold in the region, which disrupted the relationship between the UK and Venezuela even more. In fact, once the gold was found, the British actually tried extending their borders even more to include more area. Though, this move didn't really materialize to anything tangible. Then, in the late 1890s, Venezuela was able to get the United States to back their side. At this time, the US was not a fan of European nations and most definitely didn't want them expanding their reach in the Western Hemisphere. So, US forced the UK to enter into an arbitration with Venezuela to settle this border issue. Unfortunately, the arbitration committee decided to rule mostly in the favor of the British. Surprise, surprise. They did give some important waterways control to Venezuela, but borders pretty much stayed where the Schomburg line was. This is where a lot of people get the history a little wrong. People assume that Venezuela accepted the arbitration ruling, but in fact they didn't, even in 1899. 
On top of this, the US sided with Venezuela, even though there were two American votes on the arbitration committee of five that in fact voted in favor of the United Kingdom. Keep this point in mind as we'll discover the true reason behind this later. Venezuela quickly demanded the renegotiation of borders and condemned the arbitration ruling, saying that there was political collusion going on. US backed this allegation, claiming that the Russian head of the committee, who was expected to be unbiased person on the committee, actually pressured other judges into voting in favor of the UK. Now, Venezuela never accepted the results, but their focus on the issue faded a little because of domestic political issues that we won't be going over in this video. This brings us to 1945. The United Nations was just formed and in its first assembly, Venezuela denounced the arbitration ruling in front of everyone. Important to note that even after World War II, the territory is still being controlled by the United Kingdom. Then in 1949, a memorandum written by this guy was published after his death. This guy was part of the committee in 1899 that unanimously voted in favor of the United Kingdom. In the letter, he alleged that the president of the court, the Russian guy, had coerced members to agree with the final decision because there was some under the table deal between the United Kingdom and the Russians. So finally in 1962, Venezuela officially declared the 1899 ruling null and void in front of the UN. Then after years of negotiations, everyone involved signed a Geneva Agreement in 1966. By this time, British Guyana had its own government but was still under British rule. So it was the British, Venezuelan, and Guyana's government who signed the Geneva Agreement. Agreement wasn't really a solution to this issue, but in fact, it was more of an agreement on how to resolve this issue in the future. However, just months after this, Guyana gained its independence from the British, and British just wiped their hands with the issue and left it between Venezuela and Guyana. Soon after, Venezuelan army took over the islands near the border and has controlled them to this day. Since then, Venezuela went through an economic boom, then an economic bust, and a bunch of different issues that need its own video to talk about. But the main point of tailing this is that Venezuela got really preoccupied with other things to focus on the border dispute. In fact, President Hugo Savage eased the border tensions with Guyana. In 2004, Chavez said during a visit to Georgetown that he considered the dispute to be finished. All this made it seem like that this issue was a thing of the past. But then in 2015, Guyana found oil. Worse yet, they found oil in the region disputed by Venezuela. Oil was mostly found in waters off the coast of Essequibo, which is in the exclusive economic zone of whoever controls the area. But Venezuela claimed that since area wasn't Guyana's to begin with, Guyana had no right to explore or exploit the resources there. But slowly and slowly, as more and more oil was found, the dispute became more and more intense. Before things got out of control, the UN decided that disputes should be presented before the International Court of Justice, or ICJ. Venezuela argued that ICJ has no jurisdiction over this issue so they won't be showing up to the court. In return, Guyana said that if Venezuela doesn't want to show up to court, maybe the court should rule in favor of the side that is showing up to court. I get this is a serious issue, affecting hundreds of thousands if not millions of lives, but this seems like how middle school kids fight. Coming back to the story though, in October of this year, Venezuela did something that seemed to many like a pretext for an invasion. The Venezuelan National Council approved a referendum asking its citizens if they agree with integrating Essequibo as a state of Venezuela. That referendum was held just a few days ago on December the 3rd, and Guyana believes that an invasion is coming anytime now. According to Venezuelan President Maduro, the referendum passed with an overwhelming 95% vote in favor. The ICJ has ordered Venezuela to not do anything to alter the status quo until the court rules on the dispute sometime next year. But Guyana believes that that may not be enough. Brazil said recently that it has noticed notable deployment of military assets and personnel near the Venezuelan and Guyana border. And Brazil armed forces are on high alert because of this. 
Now, looking at all this, it may seem like that Venezuela kinda moved past the dispute, but then all of a sudden wants the region now because the oil was discovered there. So basically, they want oil. And who can blame them? Everyone wants oil. In fact, everyone needs oil. But I think Venezuela might be one of the few countries in this world that can confidently say they don't need oil. They have boatload of oil. And I know, I said the same thing about Guyana earlier too. So just to put the scale of Venezuelan oil reserves in perspective, if I say Guyana has a boatload of oil, then Venezuela has an ocean full of oil. Venezuela has 304 billion barrels of oil compared to Guyana's just 11 billion barrels, putting Venezuela in control of the largest oil reserves known to mankind. On top of that, because of sanctions and mismanagement, Venezuela isn't really producing much of oil at all. It only produces 700,000 barrels a day. That's less than countries like Argentina, India, and Colombia. Unless you're a hardcore follower of the oil market, you probably didn't even know that Argentina, India, and Colombia even had oil. At its current rate, it would take Venezuela more than 1,000 years to empty out its current known oil reserves. When factoring all this in, it doesn't make sense why would Venezuela want an extra 11 billion barrels, especially considering it has to go through an invasion to get it. To me personally at least, the cost doesn't seem to outweigh the benefits. So maybe the desired outcome is not oil, but it's something else. This is where we need to look at the Venezuelan leader, Nicolas Maduro. He has been the head of the state since 2013, and the country has suffered in almost every possible aspect. Venezuela has today the highest inflation in the world. Its people are forced to shuffle along in lines for toilet paper. Food shortages and the inflation is expected to close this year at over 700%. Patients in the state system are at greater risk because of a shortage of equipment and medicine. He has had his opposition politicians arrested. He has changed the structure of government, including the judicial and legislative bodies, to make sure he always stays in power. He has ordered killings of thousands of his citizens and much, much more. He has been labeled a dictator and an autocrat. The UN has accused him of committing some of the worst human rights violations in world's history. And his own courts sentenced him to 18 years in jail over corruption while he was in power. But he had already exiled the court, so no one could touch him. His government has carried out more than 20,000 killings and more than 7 million Venezuelans have fled the country under his rule. Elections are pretty much a joke under his rule. In 2018, many countries including the USA, Brazil, Canada, and countries in the European Union recognized the opposition leader as the president of Venezuela. But nothing changed. Maduro is still in power even after losing elections. As many of you already know, Venezuela has been heavily sanctioned under him. But that might change very soon. And it's all because of Russia. When Russia launched its senseless invasion of Ukraine, it started a domino effect that is now helping Maduro. It seemed like every country in the world sanctioned Russia, and West quickly started looking for ways to become less dependent on the Russian oil supply. The solution was Venezuela, the country with the biggest oil reserves. Ukraine invasion started in February 2022. And in March 2022, two senior U.S. officials went to Venezuela to open up formal talks. The goal was to get Venezuelan oil on the global market so oil prices come down. Now, the U.S. couldn't just lift all sanctions without getting anything in return. That looks weak. Negotiations took some time, but the U.S. was finally decided on a deal that benefits both sides. The U.S. said it would lift sanctions in return, Venezuela would have to release some political prisoners and hold a free and fair elections in 2024. To make sure the elections are free and fair, the international community would observe the election procedures. Now, Maduro doesn't really care about his citizens, so this isn't a case of him trading free elections for sanctions. Because in all honesty, in every country, sanctions don't really hurt the leaders at the top. It hurts the citizens the most. And if Maduro cared about his citizens, well, he would have changed course years ago. 
He's doing this now because there's a lot of domestic pressure to hold fair elections and let opposition leaders run against him. So he saw the writing on the wall and he's hoping to win some points with the voters with this sanction deal with the US. On top of that, this Essequibo referendum was a way to test where public stands in terms of Maduro's government. I know the official report says that the referendum passed with 95 plus percent votes, but that may not be entirely accurate. The Maduro government claims that 10.5 million people voted in this referendum, but the opposition disputes those figures, saying the turnout was actually less than a million people. Along with this claim, the opposition also shared photos and videos of empty polling stations all around the country. Now, it's hard to predict what Maduro will do because we don't have access to his brain. But we know his goal, and that is to stay in power. So we can narrow down the possibilities of what he could do. If he thinks there's enough support for the war, he could launch an invasion against Guyana in hopes to stoke nationalism in citizens and rally more votes behind him for 2024 election, while keeping the deal with the US to lift sanctions. But if he doesn't think he can stay in power with free elections, then he'll most likely back out with the deal with the US, and also it's unlikely he'll launch an invasion in this scenario. At the end of the day, he doesn't want oil, he just wants to keep his power. Lastly, I do want to mention that this is a very fast moving news. By the time you're watching this video, the situation on the ground might have changed. That's why you cannot just rely on videos if you want to stay informed. And that's a big reason behind why we launched Global Recaps, a geopolitical newsletter that covers world news in a quick and simple way. Every day we send out an email directly to your inbox that covers the most important world news that you can read in less than 5 minutes. Best of all, it's completely free. So if you want to keep up with this topic and more news around the world, sign up by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on your screen. It's one of the best newsletters for anyone who's interested in geopolitics, and I'm betting you that you would love it.